Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Peters, and Committee members. My name is Alice Greenwald. I'm the President and CEO of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. On behalf of everyone associated with the Memorial and Museum, I want to extend a warm welcome and express our sincere gratitude for your steadfast commitment to securing the safety of our nation. We are deeply honored to have Secretaries Chertoff, Napolitano, and Johnson here this morning, and I want to thank each of you for your dedicated service to the nation. The decision to hold this public field hearing here, within a space defined by the remaining foundational structure of the World Trade Center, at what was 18 years ago this week, the epicenter of Ground Zero, makes today's program especially meaningful. I know many of you toured the museum last night, some for the first time. The events we chronicle here, the lives we remember, and the aspirations we embrace for a world free from the scourge of terrorism are inextricably linked to the work of this committee and to the topics you will discuss today. Here at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, we testify to the largest loss of life resulting from a foreign attack on American soil and the single greatest loss of rescue personnel in a single event in American history. Our exhibitions and programs recount the collective experience of profound shock, unprecedented vulnerability, and overwhelming grief caused by the attacks. Yet visitors take away more than a cautionary tale to remain vigilant to continued threats. By sharing the manifold expressions of courage, compassion, and service in response to 9-11, this museum also affirms the best of who we can be as human beings. From its inception, the 9-11 Memorial and Museum vowed to honor and preserve the memory of all who were killed. And two days from now, this memorial will host, as we do every year, a solemn ceremony to mark the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. But in recent years, our understanding of what it means to remember has had to evolve with the tragic recognition that for far too many, 9-11 is not past history at all. For the survivors, responders, rescue and recovery workers, relief workers and volunteers, and community members exposed to hazards and toxins in the aftermath of the attacks, 9-11 is an all too present reality. The massive 16 acre recovery effort at this site lasted nine months, concluding on May 30th, 2002, with the ceremonial removal of the last column now standing directly behind you here in Foundation Hall. During that time, as well as on the day of the attacks, hundreds of thousands, it's estimated 400,000, responders and survivors, workers and residents, were exposed to hazards and toxic dust released into the air at and around the World Trade Center following the collapse of the Twin Towers on 9-11. In the 18 years since, thousands have died and tens of thousands more suffer from injuries and illnesses sustained at all three attack sites, including the Pentagon and the crash site near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The scale of the 9-11 health crisis is almost inconceivable. Over 97,000 people living in all 50 states and in 434 of 435 congressional districts are currently enrolled in the CDC's World Trade Center Health Program. This tragic situation exemplifies what we call here the longitudinal impact of terrorism, its ongoing human toll. In just two years, we will mark the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. For the witness generation, it is unbelievable that two decades will have passed. Our memories of that day are still that vivid. But there is a new generation growing up in a world defined in so many ways by a pivotal event they did not experience personally. Some are in college, some are starting their careers. If, as someone recently remarked, the 21st century started here, we must ensure that the next generation and generations to come understand the significance of the events and legacies of 9-11 so they have the tools and the perspective to negotiate the challenges ahead. National security, the topic of today's meeting, 
is among the greatest of those challenges. And it is a core programmatic focus of this memorial and museum. As evidenced by this morning's hearing, the museum has emerged as a vital convening space in which to explore issues of global security, counterterrorism, crisis leadership, and public service. We provide specially tailored training programs for professionals in law enforcement, intelligence, and the military. And we regularly offer public programs on security, defense, and foreign policy. The museum also hosts an annual summit on security, bringing together leading voices on security matters from across the public and private sectors. Our next summit will take place on November 12th and 13th, and we'll kick off with keynotes from former DNI Director Dan Coates and our Chairman Mike Bloomberg. This year's summit will also offer an opportunity for attendees to preview our next special exhibition, documenting the more than 10-year hunt for Osama bin Laden. If you are interested in attending the summit or would like to visit this exhibition at another time, please let me know. Standing here, sitting here in Foundation Hall, at the heart of Ground Zero, we are witness not only to the remnants of what was destroyed, but to the promise of a better future. This is now the foundation at Ground Zero, a place to build up from and create a safer world for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you for being here today and for your dedication and service to this singularly critical goal. Thank you, Alice. Now, if the, if the secretaries please be seated. This hearing of the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs will come to order. I would like to start with a brief moment of silence to honor the memory of all those who lost their lives on that terrible day and the first responders who continued to lose their lives to diseases they contracted in untold acts of heroism. Thank you. I would first like to thank Alice Greenwald and everyone involved in the creation of this special place. I'd like to thank the National September 11 Memorial Museum for hosting this field hearing on hallowed ground and for providing a sobering and moving and educational tour for committee members and staff last night. I'd also like to thank everyone for attending what I hope will be a thoughtful and informative event. In particular, I would like to, th to thank three of the former secretaries of the Department of Homeland Security, Secretaries Chertoff, Napolitano, and Johnson, for their attendance, testimony, and especially their service to this nation. We truly appreciate it. The title of this hearing, 18 years later, the state of Homeland Security after 9-11, describes our goal, to look back and assess what has transpired since that awful day. What actions were taken? what has and what has not been effective, and maybe most important, what has changed. In 2011, the 10th anniversary report card produced by the Bipartisan Policy Center focused on the extent to which the 9-11 Commission's 41 recommendations had been implemented. The report concluded with a reminder that, quote, we have done much, but there is much more to do. Much work remains because we are living in a world of rapid and dramatic change. It is essential to acknowledge that the world evolves, enemies adapt, new threats and problems emerge. For example, if ISIS existed in 2011, it certainly was not on most people's radar. We were worried about large-scale planned attacks by Al-Qaeda, not a terror group using video and social media to inspire lone wolf terrorists. I doubt that the creators of the internet and social media platforms ever contemplated how their innovations could be used for such evil. In his book, Slouching Towards Gomorrah, 
Robert Bork illustrated how the internet provided an opportunity for previously isolated deviants to connect to others. Social media has sped up the process that Daniel Patrick Moynihan accurately described as, quote, defining deviancy down. As a result, we have experienced the depressing proliferation of homegrown violent extremists, mass shootings, and domestic terror attacks. Another dramatic shift that has occurred involves the composition of illegal immigration. In 2011, only 3,938 unaccompanied children from Central America were apprehended entering our southwest border illegally. And the phenomenon of families exploiting our laws was so minor we weren't even keeping track of them. 11 months into this fiscal year, more than 69,000 unaccompanied children from Central America and 432,000 family members have been apprehended with most claiming asylum and being allowed to stay. I use these examples to highlight the evolving complexity of the problems we face and our inability to effectively address them. Unfortunately, there are not many solutions as easy and effective as hardening the cockpit doors. As chairman of this committee, I have attempted to guide us through the problem-solving process, gather information, properly define problems, identify root causes, establish achievable goals, and then, only after completing that work, begin to design workable solutions. Too often in the political realm, solutions are directed toward unachievable goals, and they simply do not reflect reality. The 10th anniversary report card details significant impl implementation of the 9-11 Commission's 41 recommendations. But those were solutions in response to 9-11. In 2015, this committee's then-ranking member, Senator Tom Coburn, issued a report reviewing the Department of Homeland Security. He detailed $544 million spent between, by DHS from 2003 to 2014 and criticized the department for, quote, not successfully executing any of its fine main mission, five main missions. Let me, quick as an aside, mention what those five missions are. Prevent terrorism, enhance security. Secure and manage our borders. Enforce and minister our immigration laws. Safeguard and secure cyberspace. Strengthen national preparedness and resilience. And I also have to say in that report, as harsh as it was, it was not a reflection on the current Secretary, Secretary Johnson, or past secretaries. In, in fact, he calls out in that report the management skills in your unity of effort, uh, or unity of uh, effort initiative. But it's still a pretty harsh assessment, and after 18 years, it is necessary to, to ask some hard questions based on experience. For example, is DHS too big? Does it have too many missions? Can we expect one department to be responsible for natural disasters, preventing domestic terror attacks, cybersecurity, protecting critical infrastructure, enforcing immigration laws, securing our borders, investigating counterfeit currency, protecting government officials. Not only does the list go on, but in addition to its operational responsibilities, DHS also reports to 92 congressional committees and subcommittees of jurisdiction, plus another 27 caucuses, commissions, and groups. The complex set of problems our nation faces will not be solved with heated rhetoric in the midst of political squabbling. It will require individuals working together in good faith, as members of this committee have done so often in the past. That's why I am grateful that a bipartisan group of senators has the opportunity to be here today to learn from a bipartisan group of former secretaries. I hope that through this work, we can fairly evaluate past successes and failures and use these assessments to guide future actions and policies designed to secure our homeland. Again, I thank the secretaries and look forward to your testimony with that, Senator Peters. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Johnson, uh, for uh, convening uh, this is an important hearing, and uh, thank you to Alice Greenwald and the entire Nas National September 11th Memorial and Museum staff for uh, hosting us uh, here today. I'm also grateful to our former Homeland Security secretaries for joining us uh, to share your thoughts uh, as well as your expertise. This uh, hallowed space is quiet and peaceful today. We are surrounded by the remnants of the towers that were destroyed and the treasured memories of 2,977 lives taken 18 years ago at the World Trade Center, at the Pentagon, 
and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. My colleagues and I had the opportunity to tour the museum and the memorial yesterday and the experience uh, this extraordinary tribute to the lives uh, that were lost in the most devastating attack on American soil, tribute to the families who lost their loved ones and the first responders who so bravely ran into danger to save the lives of others. Behind us is the last column, the final piece of steel that was removed from ground zero after the nine-month-long recovery effort had ended. Today, it stands as a monument honoring the 441 first responders, police, firefighters, and rescue workers who gave their lives in the line of duty. This week, we remember and honor the lives lost on September 11, 2001, and we must also reflect on the lessons that we have learned in the years since as we work to prevent a tragedy like this from ever happening again. In the days following September 11th, our nation felt, for the first time, that we were vulnerable to the dangers of a very volatile world. In those frightful days, no one knew what the future would hold, only that we would rise from the rubble, united, and resolve to be stronger than ever. It was out of that uncertainty and determination to protect this nation from future attacks that the Department of Homeland Security was founded. The new department, which rapidly grew to be one of our nation's largest federal agencies, was comprised of nearly two dozen large and diverse agencies, many of which had operated for decades as independent actors. In the face of tragedy, these organizations, each with their own very unique cultures and histories, coalesced around a very single and focused mission and under one banner. The Department of Homeland Security was created with one primary mission in mind, combating the scourge of terrorism and ensuring that we could say with confidence, never again. However, in the years that have since passed, as the world around us has changed, so too have the challenges facing this great nation and this vital department. Today, DHS confronts a new generation of persistent and evolving threats, more complex and diffuse than we could have possibly imagined just a few years ago. With each passing day, our world becomes more interconnected, cementing the important role cybersecurity plays in our everyday lives. A rise, a rise in violence driven by racism, religious discrimination, and other hateful ideologies has altered our perception of domestic terrorism and the threats that they pose. And one of the gravest threats to our national security does not fly a flag or adhere to an ideology. Yet climate change poses an existential threat, not just to the United States, but to our entire planet. The Department of Homeland Security is our first line of defense against these and many other challenges, some of which have evolved or risen since this department was created. As the threats to our homeland change, so must the efforts to protect our national security. With nearly two decades of lessons learned, the time has come for a clear-eyed assessment of what has worked and what needs to be improved. As we reflect on what the Department has accomplished to date, we must consider whether the size and the complexity of DHS can keep pace with the constantly evolving threats of a rapidly changing world. In order to build a more sustainable Department and defend ourselves from global threats, we must look to the future. It is not enough to understand the threats of the moment. We must also ensure that DHS is prepared to anticipate and identify those threats arising in the future. This is a very difficult conversation, but one that we must have to keep our country safe and ensure that we never again face a catastrophic event like September 11. Thank you, Senator Peters. Uh, as the secretaries may be aware, it's our tradition to swear in witnesses, so if you'll all stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God? Our first secretary is uh, former Secretary Michael Chertoff who is the founder and executive chairman of the Chertoff Group and is, and is senior of counsel at the law firm Covington and Burling. Mr. Chertoff was the second secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, serving under President George W. Bush. He led the department from 2005 until 2009. Earlier in his career, he was a federal judge on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals 
and was head of the U.S. Department of Criminal Justice, U.S. Department of Justice's Criminal Division. Secretary Chertoff. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Senator Peters and members of the committee. I, I uh, deeply appreciate and am honored by the opportunity to appear before the committee, and particularly in this setting, which is so meaningful. I also know that in the audience we have a number of senior security officials from the State of New York, uh, the Fire Department of New York, and the Port Authority, which of course is the uh, uh, organization that houses this facility. Um, I also would like to request respectfully that my written testimony be made part of the record. No objection. I have uh, very vivid personal memories of September 11th. Very briefly, I was head of the criminal division, and within minutes after the second plane hit the tower uh, in the World Trade Center, I was at the operations center in the FBI with then FBI Director Bob Mueller uh, trying to figure out first who had done it, and perhaps more important, how do we stop it from happening again? And I have vivid memories of hearing about the plane that went down in Shanksville. I also having heard the order transmitted to shoot the plane down if necessary, something I never would have imagined I would live to hear. Um, within a matter of days after September 11th, I was here on the site with the Attorney General and the FBI Director touring the rubble, and you could still experience uh, the smell and the visual sights of the destruction, which were almost unimaginable. So for me, this is uh, an opportunity again to remember what is for the whole country, and maybe for the whole world, a seminal event of our lifetimes. Uh, it's obviously very appropriate to use the impending anniversary as a way to honor those who died and those who volunteered to run into harm's way to try to protect victims of this attack. Firefighters, police, and then in the weeks and months and years afterwards, those who left the comfort of their homes to volunteer to join the armed forces and to continue to protect us against an enemy that was based overseas. But I'm also mindful of what um, was said previously about the fact that we are coming up on 20 years, a generation of time that has passed since September 11th. And I think about the fact that there are now young folks in college for whom this is a history lesson not a vivid memory. And so, of course, the question naturally arises, when the next generation comes on the scene, what will they be facing and what will they remember? And will they, God forbid, have another similar event to reflect upon? And I think that is very much, to my mind, the value and the importance of this hearing. What is the next generation going to face, and how do we adapt ourselves to what that might be? So I have basically three uh, brief observations about this. One is, um, I regard the 9-11 event and some of the events we saw thereafter um, as what I call terrorism 1.0. That was bin Laden's vision of high-impact events with large mass casualties and very dramatic visual scenes of destruction and death. And I have to say the Department and the whole United States government has been quite successful in making sure an attack of that scale has not been successful since September 11th. We came close a couple of times. Some of you will remember the August 2006 airline plot, which we frustrated, which would have blown up 12 airliners, leaving Heathrow Airport coming to North America. But it's important that our success not lead us to complacency. Uh, because the enemies of this country still look to the possibility of a mass attack, whether it's explosions, chemical attacks, or biological attacks. And as we saw in the months after 9-11, if you give terrorist organizations a safe haven, they will begin to experiment with chemical weapons, biological weapons, and other kinds of weapons of catastrophe. And it's important that we deny them those safe havens. And I would say, in connection with that, as we look at ongoing discussions with respect to the future of Afghanistan, let's be sure we do not sacrifice our ability to strangle any plots to recreate the labs and the training centers before they get started again. 
Um, I would also say that we've seen a morphing of terrorism into what I call 2.0 and 3.0. 2.0 being smaller scale attacks like we saw in Mumbai or in, in the Bataclan um, nightclub in France, which are coordinated and trained but don't have the scale of a 9-11. And then perhaps even more alarmingly is what I call 3.0, inspired attacks where people are basically incited over the internet uh, to go out and pick up car keys, guns, or make bombs using the materials in their mother's kitchen in order to kill people randomly, just in order to keep a marker that the terrorists are going to continue to attack. And here I have to say we have not only jihadi terrorists, which uh, are still uh, networked internationally with each other, but we're seeing other ideological terrorists also rising, what we sometimes call domestic terrorism, whether it's white supremacists or other kinds of ideological groups. And even those are not purely domestic. They are reaching across borders, using the internet to incite each other, to boast about the number of people that they've killed, and to continue to carry out these attacks. And so we need to start to think about strategies to deal with this kind of terrorism which to my mind involves much more involvement of local authorities and local social services, but also the creation of what I call off-ramps, ways you might intervene with people who are beginning to get into that mindset and divert them before they wind up having to be in the criminal justice system, or worse, wind up carrying out an attack. And finally, the third area we need to continue to focus on is cyber warfare. We see ransomware attacks on our cities that are shutting down services. We've seen in other parts of the world, like Ukraine, attacks on critical infrastructure that have shut the lights off. We need to raise our game with respect to this, and it's got to be a public-private partnership. Along these lines, we also are beginning to see the recurrence of what used to be called active measures, which is the use by foreign adversaries like Russia of social media and other tools to attempt to influence and disrupt our democracy and our social unity. And finally, I would like to say just very briefly before I conclude that um, I do think DHS has largely succeeded in the missions that were set out for itself, as witnessed the fact we haven't had another 9-11, but the organization must continue to adapt to these new challenges and new threats. Um, I think most of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission were adopted, uh, but I do have to say uh, Congress still needs to streamline oversight, which I think is the one major suggestion which has not uh, really been implemented. So thank you very much, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you, thank you Secretary Chertoff. Our, our next Secretary is former Secretary Janet Napolitano, who is the president of the University of California, who got some great rankings recently in the Wall Street Journal poll. Uh, Ms. Napolitano served as Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security from 2009 to 2013 under President Barack Obama. Prior to serving as Secretary, she was the Governor of Arizona from 2003 to 2009, <coughs> Attorney General of Arizona from 1998 to 2003, and U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona from 1993 to 1997. Secretary Thank you, Chairman Johnson and Ranking Member Peters and members of the committee. I want to thank you for conducting this important field hearing and for inviting me to participate. I am grateful for the work you do on behalf of the American people, and I am honored to be with you this morning here at the National September 11 Memorial and Museum. Eighteen years after the attack, September 11th remains a somber day on which we mourn and reflect on the nearly 3,000 lives lost in the attack on our nation. As we honor the memory of those whose lives were taken on that fateful morning, so too we express our gratitude to the first responders, law enforcement, and volunteers who pulled people from the wreckage of the Pentagon, from the World Trade Center, and who themselves many later succumbed to illness or died as a result of their recovery efforts. I'd also like to thank the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security for the work they do to keep us safe day in and day out. 
they are true patriots and i'm grateful for their service to our nation and finally i would like to acknowledge former secretaries chertoff and johnson who are here today and who so ably led the department during their respective tenures from the beginning of my tenure as secretary at dhs we focused our mission on terrorism aviation security cyber security and border management and security, as well as the security of the global supply chain, the trafficking of goods and humans, and the resilience of the nation to natural disasters. To meet these challenges, we relied on intelligence to develop and implement effective programs and operations while working to make travel, trade, and commerce more seamless for the public. We created TSA PreCheck, and significantly expanded global entry, customs trade partnership against terrorism, and customs preclearance. We also transformed border security, immigration enforcement, and disaster preparation, response, and recovery. But as we all know, and as the former speakers have alluded, threats against our homeland are not static. They evolve, and we in the department must adapt with them. So today I would like to speak with you about three areas that I believe the country must focus on. Cybersecurity, mass casualty shootings, and the effects of global warming or climate change. And I will address one issue that I believe is not a threat to the homeland, the United States border with Mexico. With the cybersecurity and infrastructure, uh, security agency, DHS has stepped up to its cyber capabilities, but we have much more to do in this area. Our nation's critical infrastructure, its utility grids, election systems, and our public and private networks all are vulnerable. Our adversaries and international criminal organizations have become more determined and more brazen in their efforts to attack us and to steal from us. We need a whole of government and a whole of public and private sector response to this threat. And it needs to happen now. We can outthink, out innovate, and out research those who seek to do us harm by, among other things, investing in our nation's, nation's research enterprise and leveraging such things as the tremendous capabilities and intellectual resources at the Department of Energy National Laboratories. The less technical threat of mass casualty shootings is no less consequential than those posed in the cyber arena. Many in our country have sadly grown all too accustomed to stories of yet another mass shooting. DHS's Office of Intelligence and Analysis was created to evaluate the nexus between threat and vulnerability. It needs to be aggressive in doing so with respect to gun violence and mass casualty shootings. I believe in the Second Amendment, but it did not contemplate citizens with combat-ready assault rifles. I believe people should be able to use weapons for recreation, hunting, and protection. But if you cannot hit your target with 10 shots, you should not be shooting a gun. It is time for Congress to ban high capacity magazines and assault weapons, and it is time to enact universal background checks. It's also time for Congress and DHS to recognize that climate change is a generational threat to the homeland that must be addressed in a meaningful way. The uptick in extreme weather events on land and on our shores clearly impacts the missions of FEMA and the U.S. Coast Guard. From rescue and reconnaissance to disaster preparation, response, and recovery, our changing climate requires DHS to approach those missions differently. Climate evolution also implicates our border and our immigration system thereby directly affecting USCIS, CBP, and ICE. Extreme weather is destroying crop yields in Central and South America, devastating economies, and drying up jobs and gainful employment opportunities. With lost jobs and lost wages, the aperture toward radicalization widens as 
as does the draw of northward migration. There are many factors that lead the migration to the United States, but the downstream effects of climate change are certainly among them. If we as a nation fail to address climate change in a holistic and global way as a threat to the homeland, we will be ignoring one of the nation's and the world's greatest security risks. And finally, I would like to address a topic that I do not believe is a threat to the homeland, the U.S. border with Mexico. I've worked on issues related to that border for nearly 30 years as a prosecutor, a governor, and a secretary of DHS. I've walked it, ridden it on horseback, flown it in fixed and rotor wing aircraft, explored its tunnels, and visited almost every land port of entry. There have been times during my three decades of public service when I did argue that the border was a threat, but now is not such a time. The border is a zone where millions of dollars of lawful commerce, trade, and travel traverse each day. It produces jobs for citizens living along it and throughout the United States. On its own, it is an economic engine. Proper border management requires a blend of physical infrastructure, manpower, and technology. What we do not need and what doesn't make sense is a wall from one end of the border to the other. As governor of Arizona, I once proclaimed, show me a 10-foot wall and I will show you an 11-foot ladder. That was more than a decade ago and it is still true today. The debate about a costly and needless border wall should come to an end. It distracts from the overall mission of DHS. It is a red herring. I urge this committee to consider putting an end to discussions on a border wall and to return your worthy attention to more immediate challenges of securing our homeland. I'm grateful for the opportunity to appear before you today, and like Secretary Chertoff and Secretary Johnson, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Secretary Napolitano. Uh, I would ask you to turn off your microphone. Only three of these can be operating at one point in time. Uh, our third secretary is former Secretary Jay Johnson, who is a partner with the New York City-based law firm of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. Mr. Johnson served as Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security from 2013 through 2017 under President Barack Obama. Prior to serving as Secretary, he was General Counsel for the Department of Defense from 2009 to 2012 and the Department of the Air Force from 1998 to 2001, and an Assistant United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York from 1989 to 1991. Secretary Johnson. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Peters, members of this committee, good morning. Welcome to New York City, my hometown. Accompanied by my predecessors, Mike Chertoff and Janet Napolitano, I welcome the opportunity to testify at this field hearing in Lower Manhattan in conjunction with the 18th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Senators Johnson and Carper will recall that on the 14th anniversary of 9-11, they accompanied me to the annual observance in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Like millions of others, 9-11 is painful and significant to me. I am a New Yorker. I was in New York City on 9-11, and I personally witnessed the collapse of the two towers. 9-11 also happens to be my birthday. Out of that day 18 years ago came my personal commitment to national security. In the years that followed, as the Chairman noted, I served as General Counsel of the Department of Defense and as your Secretary of Homeland Security for three years. Three years ago, on the 15th anniversary of 9-11, I presided at the ceremony to welcome the federal government back to One World Trade Center. My DHS office in New York City sat on the 50th floor of that building as a point of personal privilege. I'd like to acknowledge someone here who is probably one of the five best friends I have in the world, Roger Perino, retired New York City police detective. I've known him for 30 years. We worked drug cases together when I was a prosecutor and he was a cop. He was one of those who ran into harm's way 18 years ago on 9-11 and for his actions was awarded the Medal of Valor by the, by the mayor of the city of New York. 
Any assessment of today's Homeland Security must include an assessment of today's Department of Homeland Security. I confess that, when, that I view today's DHS with despair and dismay. The Department appears to be under constant siege in constant crisis, suffering from management upheaval and leadership vacancies, and crippled, attacked, and constantly sued for the abrupt launch of ill-conceived, controversial immigration policies. More so than ever before, DHS is now villainized and politically radioactive. There are public calls for a boycott of private businesses that contract with DHS, while certain elected officials call for the outright elimination of certain components of DHS, if not DHS in its entirety. In the current environment, it is easy to forget that DHS is responsible for the vital missions of protecting the American people and their homeland from the land, sea, air, and in cyberspace. The Coast Guard performs vital maritime safety, national security, law enforcement, and counter-drug functions. The Secret Service protects the President and others. TSA provides aviation security to over 2 million people per day. FEMA is the nation's disaster response agency. The NCIC is the U.S. government's primary information exchange hub for the nation's cybersecurity. These are matters in which politics should play little, if any, role, and around which there should be bipartisan consensus and support. Yet the department and its leadership appear to be overwhelmed by the politically contentious and emotional immigration mission and the crises that have existed on the southern border. To the exclusion, I fear, of all these other important homeland security missions. For the nation's cabinet-level department charged with protecting the American homeland and its people it shouldn't have to be this way. I know every member of this committee agrees with that. Mr. Chairman, I'm very appreciative that you and the members of this committee have held this hearing here in this hallowed place in this bipartisan spirit. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Secretary Johnson. Um, nor normally, I defer my questioning, but I, in my opening statement, I asked a basic question. We had a what I consider a pretty uh, lively discussion last night uh, in regard to it. So I'll just throw it open to all three secretaries uh, because you kind of alluded to it as well. Um, when you have a crisis, whether it's three hurricanes and wildfires, when you have, as I described, you know, the flow of uh, children, but primarily people as family members, reaching hundreds of thousands in a year, uh, how can an individual, you all serve as secretaries, how can you handle it when you're overwhelmed in one area and you have this department that has so many other different missions? So I'll just throw open the question. We'll start with Secretary Chertoff and then just go right, right down the line. Is DH, <coughs> DHS too big? Is, is, is the, does it have too many missions? Should we reevaluate how it's structured? So let, let me say this, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the question. Um, let me begin by saying, first of all, fortunately, the Secretary doesn't have to do everything himself or herself. And I have to say one of the strengths of the department has been the professionalism of the career people who work in all of the agencies. And that was something which uh, I was able to rely upon during a very tumultuous four-year period. Um, I would say that you, know, you could tweak little elements of the department, but honestly, I think, uh, particularly as it's been matured by my two successors here and, and subsequently, I think the ability to have a unity of effort where you bring the resources and skills related to prevention of terrorism, to reducing vulnerabilities, uh, and to response and resilience, I think that that's much more of a positive than a negative. Uh, you know, there were, just de there were debates at various points in time about whether you should treat cyber as a separate agency. I will tell you from my experience, not only in government, but in the private sector, often the attacks that we view as cyber attacks come uh, along with a physical attack as well. And the ability to protect your infrastructure requires you have a holistic view, what we call convergence, rather than a fragmented view. So I would argue that the uh, key here is to continue to build and mature the unity of effort um, and to, again, maintain the tradition, which I think we've had through um, a number of administrations, 
of having the non-political professional operators carrying out the important mission of protecting the country and building resilience. Secretary Napolitano. Yeah, I, I agree with Secretary Chertoff. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I, I would note that when the, sec when the Department of Defense was created in the wake of World War II, uh, most uh, uh, analysts um, uh, say that it took over 40 years for the Department of Defense to uh, uh, really become integrated. Um, and the Department of Homeland Security is much uh, younger than that. It has many more missions. So, uh, but it's, it is maturing. It is coming together. And the effort spent tweaking, moving one box here, one box there, I think would not be worth the effort. Um, I, I would uh, suggest uh, respectfully that one area uh, that could really help the department would be um, to streamline congressional oversight. Uh, and I know that's delicate, it requires committees to uh, give up some jurisdiction, uh, but uh, the, the Committee on Homeland Security has a tradition of being an operating in a fairly bipartisan way and uh, being uh, a, a very good overseer of the department and it, it needs to push some of those other committees out of the way. Well, thank you. As you know from our discussion last night, you're preaching the choir here. We, we, this committee actually passed a bill to begin that process, establish a commission. I, I'm completely sympathetic with that. Uh, again, your voices, I think, would be important to hopefully get that accomplished. Secretary Johnson. So I have the most recent experience here. My, my answer is, uh, in one sense, it's too large, and in one sense, it's not large enough. Uh, Prior to DHS, I came from being the general counsel for the entire Department of Defense, which is larger than DHS by multiples. The Department of the Air Force or the Department of the Navy in and of themselves are larger than DHS. <clears throat> and it's the third largest cabinet level department. But it's too big in the following sense. Its missions are very diffuse, very decentralized. The cultures across DHS are vastly different. The culture of FEMA versus the Secret Service versus the Coast Guard. And the command and control structure of DHS lacks the maturity of the DOD. So one Christmas, I set out to send an email to every person in DHS who was a direct report to me. And I just kept going and going, thinking of people who report directly to me. So by noon, I had to stop. Uh, there were so many people that I felt like I had to write to. By contrast, you look at the Department of Defense, there is, for an example, somebody, a Senate-confirmed undersecretary who has the oversight function over all of DOD's <coughs> intelligence uh, missions. And so, except for the component leaders, and there are seven or eight of them, there's no middle-level management, really, between those people and uh, the secretary. I, I'm, I'm very pleased that Congress, just before or after I left office, codified the, the joint task force structure that I created so that we have more of a DOD type model when it comes to, to border security. Um, the other thing I'd say is, in, some, in one respect, I think we actually need to go further. I'd like to see our government, and this is probably politically unobtainable, uh, consolidate more of the federal law enforcement missions under one cabinet level person. Um, if I could wave a wand, I would take every federal law enforcement agency, put it under one cabinet level official, uh, not necessarily the attorney general, who's the chief prosecutor, and deconflict all other missions, much like they do in ministries of the interior in other nations, but, you know, it's probably politically impossible to do that. So in that sense, I don't think we've gone far enough consolidating our law enforcement mission. I know there's discussion of possibly moving the Secret Service to the Treasury, back to the Treasury Department. I would not do that. Secret Service is essentially a law enforcement agency, and when you're talking about large security operations like the General Assembly, it makes a lot of sense to have the Secret Service as part of one cabinet level department 
with HSI, with FEMA, with the Coast Guard, and one pair of eyes and ears looking at all the threats and all the different ways someone can enter the country. Well, again, I really appreciate those responses. I think it's important testimony. It, it can and should carry an awful lot of weight, so thank you. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, while the, uh, the department was established uh, in 2002 in response to an attack planned and, and directed by a foreign terrorist uh, organization, uh, since then we know that the, uh, the country and the threat landscape uh, has evolved uh, dramatically. Uh, in recent years, domestic terrorists have killed more people uh, in our country than international terrorists. Uh, and most of the FBI's domestic terrorism uh, investigations uh, involve white supremacist violence. Secretary Napolitano, uh, during your tenure, uh, you uh, were there uh, probably at a turning point when we saw the threats landscape uh, change in the current wave of white supremacist violence. I'd be curious as to your assessment as to uh, how you address that, uh, what more you think we need to do, were there impediments, and certainly would like to hear from the other secretaries as well as to how we deal with this significant threat we're facing now. Yes, so I, uh, uh, one of the uh, manifestations of this threat um, is the radicalization of uh, uh, lone actors um, through uh, the internet, uh, through social media. Uh, and we don't really have a good understanding about what causes somebody to read something uh, uh, online, et cetera, all the way up to going out and purchasing a combat-ready uh, weapon and taking it out on, on their fellow citizens. So um, uh, to me, uh, we need to do much more in uh, the sense of understanding the motivations uh, behind uh, these violent actors. Um, we need to involve more local uh, law enforcement and social service providers in trying to find, as Secretary Chertoff said, off-ramps uh, for these individuals. Uh, and we clearly need to prioritize these kind of domestic terrorist events in the sense of the, the threats facing the country. Secretary Chertoff. Um, I, I agree with that. I think, um, first of all, we need to recognize that in many ways, um, what I call terrorism 3.0, which are the inspired jihadi terrorists uh, that we saw, we've seen in various things, uh, for example, in California, uh, are very similar to the white supremacist uh, terrorists who are inspired to carry out shootings in synagogues. Uh, there seems to be a capability of networks of people who are very ideological to find like-minded people who are beginning to move in that direction and to incite them to carry out acts of violence. And as, as Secretary Napolitano said, we need to understand that. We also need to recognize this is a global challenge. It's not just a domestic challenge. Uh, when you look at some of the shootings we've seen recently, we've seen ref references to Grevik, the Norwegian white supremacist, or the Christchurch shooter, where they, they essentially look for an endorsement uh, along that line from the network around the world. So this, to me, is not just an American issue, but it's an issue we have to deal with involving our partners overseas as well. Mr. Ray Johnson. My first, second, and third answers are gun safety, gun safety, gun safety. Beyond that, uh, continued good law enforcement uh, initiatives to counter violent extremism at the federal and local level grants from the national level to state and local law enforcement, which include active shooter training exercises, support for active shooter training exercises, which I think are very important, and uh, public vigilance, public awareness, various if you see something, say something campaigns. DHS has partnered with a number of um, cities, a number of professional sports teams, uh, public awareness, public vigilance, does make a difference. Secretary Johnson, you mentioned gun safety, gun safety, gun safety. Uh, there are a number of uh, actions that we could take, but one that may be before uh, the Congress uh, this week is to expand background checks. Uh, would you support that? Do you think it's necessary? I'd like to hear from the other two as well. I support anything consistent with the Second Amendment um, that has bipartisan support. Um, 
that makes it more difficult for a deranged, violent person to get his hands on a gun, specifically an assault weapon. Secretary Napolitano. I think that uh, the uh, universal background checks is a good step towards uh, greater security for the country, um, but it is a first step. Secretary so Chertoff. Uh, I agree. Uh, we ought to have universal background checks, and, and I guess in a similar vein, so-called red flag laws, where when someone winds up behaving in a way that uh, suggests that there may be a menace, that we actually remove their access to any firearms they have. Uh, there are some other things we could do as well, as, as I think Secretary Napolitano said. I'm not sure why they need to be selling magazines with 100 rounds. Uh, if you can't hit the bird with the first 10, you probably shouldn't be hunting. Thank you. Secretary Johnson and I, uh, just over a week ago, sent a letter to DHS uh, uh, with our Homeland Security Committee colleagues regarding allegations that uh, this administration has quietly dismantled or cut back on multiple programs that were created after September 11th, attacks to detect and prevent terrorism, specifically programs operated by the department's uh, Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction uh, Office. So my question uh, is, I'd like to have each of you give uh, a brief opinion on your assessment of the nation's current readiness to prevent a chemical, biological, or radiological, uh, or nuclear attack. We'll start with you, uh, Secretary Johnson. My, I haven't been privy to uh, intelligence or, or non-public information, obviously, for the last two and a half years on this. Um, <clears throat> my sense is that it's a threat that we have and we continue, should continue to monitor uh, among a range of threats, um, but it's obviously not the only threat. Um, you know, I dealt on a daily basis with the threats of some of the things that uh, Mike referred to in terms of smaller scale uh, terrorist inspired attacks, uh, but it's uh, this type of threat that you described, Senator, is something we need to keep our, need to continue to be vigilant about. There we go. Uh, Senator, uh, I agree. Uh, uh, we need to maintain vigilance. Uh, we need to understand that um, active intelligence sharing, real-time intelligence sharing uh, uh, with uh, our allies around the world increases our security in this area um, to the extent we're dealing with uh, weapons of mass destruction that are manufactured abroad but are attempted to be smuggled into the United States. So the intelligence sharing internationally, globally, should not be overlooked as an effective tactic or technique uh, to help secure the country. Uh, I agree with, with um, what both secretaries have said. Uh, and as I said in my opening statement, when I was secretary, we did worry quite a bit about chemical and biological and <coughs> radiological attacks. And one of the reasons we did is because in Afghanistan, when we entered, we found labs where al-Qaeda was experimenting, trying to develop these kinds of weapons. The good news is by reducing the footprint of ISIS, we've reduced the territory in which they could carry out that kind of work. But I, I think complacency is a real risk here. And again, as we talk about the future arrangements in Afghanistan, um, I would not want to see that become a safe haven again where we, we could see experimentation with these kinds of weapons. I'd also like to mention Hezbollah, which to my mind uh, still remains the uh, maybe most proficient terrorist organization in the world, uh, which has access to a regime that certainly has um, moved in the direction of WMD. And again, we need to be very careful in sharing intelligence with our allies to make sure that Hezbollah does not become an attack vector with some of these weapons. Thank you. Senator Romney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to those that have helped organize this event in, in a place where we can remember and, uh, and mourn uh, and honor uh, those who uh, stepped heroically in to save others. Uh, and we can mourn the many, many, uh, not just that were killed on 9-11, but those of the years after that have been so devastated by the effects of their heroism. I appreciate the uh, testimony of each of the secretaries and your willingness to be with us today. Uh, you acknowledged in our uh, discussions last night that uh, 
that in some respects we, we play the role of a, of a board or a policy group and, uh, uh, and as a, a committee we have the opportunity to help uh, guide the leadership at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the area of cyber uh, and cyber threats has been mentioned by each one of you as being a major area of concern um, and, and I'd like just to dwell for a moment on that. Um, Secretary Napolitano, you indicated that perhaps more funding to uh, Department of Energy laboratories to help develop new technologies there would be helpful. Um, uh, you also referenced public-private uh, partnerships, and there's no question that the private sector is racing to try and find technologies that they can sell, make money on to, uh, to protect uh, various uh, uh, entities from, from cyber attack. Uh, uh, Secretary Johnson, you indicated in your, your written testimony that uh, that deterring actors from attacking us, uh, cyber actors, is also something we should pursue. And, and perhaps we'll begin with you then, Secretary Johnson, and have each of you respond to what we might do to up our capabilities in, in deterring cyber attacks. Uh, specifically, I, I'm thinking in, in, with regards to your testimony, how can we deter those entities that attack us? China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, they continue to launch hundreds, thousands of attacks on on uh, technical databases, uh, government databases, uh, corporations, and so forth. Uh, is there some way we can do a better job of deterring that? And then for all of you, uh, how do we up our game in cyber uh, beyond where we are today? I think it's a basic equation. Um, in my experience, all nation states, all organized nation states, whether they're democracies or monarchies or communist regimes, are deterred if the behavior is made cost prohibitive, if the nation state recognizes that it's just not worth the cost in terms of the reaction of the, of the target. And <clears throat> we all know that within, uh, between and among governments, there's a certain amount of surveillance activity that goes on. Uh, but we're, as I'm sure you recognize, at a new level of the theft of intellectual property, weaponizing things for political purposes that are, that are hacked, that are stolen. And I believe that you cannot create a complete line of defense against these kinds of attacks, and therefore we have to put it to the bad actor and simply make the behavior cost prohibitive. I think that a lot good a lot of good things have been done in this administration in terms of sanctions directed at Russians, the Russian government, um, and by the Congress. But if you believe the intelligence assessments, a lot more is necessary, both directed against Russia and the other countries that you, you mentioned. Now, in terms of what more we can do on the defensive side, uh, on my watch, we really enhance the capability of the NKIC, which is within uh, DHS, it's the information hub for cybersecurity, but I was disappointed when I was leaving office that not more private sector actors had partnered with DHS for information sharing purposes. And so I'd recommend to Congress that you, you check in on that occasionally and you see what you can do to more encourage that type of information sharing. Yes, I think that NKIC is a valuable resource uh, at the department for bringing together the public and private aspects of cybersecurity. Um, you know, cyber is an inordinately complicated topic. It's international in scope. Uh, uh, the technology changes faster than we can change laws or a policy. It requires an agility and nimbleness that is really not the hallmark of government. That is one of the reasons why it's so important to uh, bring the private sector into how we deal with cybersecurity as a country. We need a whole of government, a whole of nation approach to this area. We need to recognize that it is among the top three risks that we face as a nation. Um, you know, when you read the 9-11 Commission report, uh, one of the key critiques it, it makes is that there were all these red, they were, re, they were reverse engineering how the 9-11 attack occurred. And the report points out all these red flags that had arisen and they said that uh, a key critique is that our government leaders suffered from a failure of imagination. In the cyber arena, we have all these red flags now. Uh, we should not uh, uh, entertain such a failure of imagination. 
uh, and perhaps uh, it is time for the country to have uh, a 9-11 commission for cyber before we have, for example, massive ransomware attacks simultaneously conducted uh, around the country. Uh, or where we uh, uh, suffer once again a direct attack on our democracy as we saw in the 2016 election. <clears throat> so let me just add this. Um, I mean, the challenge here is that much of the infrastructure is in private hands. Um, and even when it's in government hands, it's often distributed in local governments. And sometimes even the basics uh, don't get done. And that's a challenge, because you're really trying to herd the cats in a particular direction. Um, I'd say there are a, a three things, though, that I might pay some additional attention to. Uh, one is I do think that the department has made a good step forward in standing up CISA from what used to be the NPPD and becoming more operationally involved in working with the private sector on upping their game. One of the things that would help would be to give private sector actors more access to classified information. Right now, it's very hard to pass the suitability test, which is a requirement that you have a need to know classified information. It's nothing to do with, with whether you're a reliable person. It's just whether you have a need to know. If you're a contractor, that's an easy thing to satisfy. But if you're running critical infrastructure, it gets difficult. And I think uh, changing the mindset on that and opening up the aperture for information would be very helpful. Second, I do agree we need sometimes, particularly with nation states, to be able to impose a cost. But uh, we have to be candid. Uh, the structure in terms of how we escalate is still very undefined. And what we don't want to do is accidentally trigger a war because we overreact to something. So I think there needs to be some serious thought and perhaps some, some hearings on the question of what is the appropriate scale of escalation in response to certain attacks. <clears throat> and finally, um, I think we need to look at um, our, what I would call industrial policy as it relates to very sensitive technology. And uh, Mike McConnell, the former DNI, and I did a piece on this a few weeks ago. Um, we don't have a policy to encourage uh, U.S. or uh, allied businesses to invest in critical technologies that we need to control in order to make sure the Chinese don't own us and eat our lunch. And you're seeing this play out with 5G right now, where Huawei, with Chinese government subsidies, is pushing out to have the equipment that forms the backbone of 5G around the world. We go to our allies, we say, don't do this. And a lot, and I've done this myself, and a lot of times what we hear back is, well, the problem is you can't beat something with nothing. What do you have that's better and cheaper? And part of the problem is we haven't facilitated a market in that kind of technology. We do it in the defense business with a defense industrial base. I would argue we need to now have a policy like that with what I would call the tech national security base, and that I think would be well worth looking at. Senator Carper. I, I, I want to begin, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to um, Senator Peters, thank you so much to you and your staff for uh, really coming up with this idea and for us to have been here last night and had an incredibly moving and inspiring tour uh, hosted by a, a very gifted, talented woman who leads this organization and has done so for more than a dozen years. I just want to thank everybody who works here as part of this team and a lot of the volunteers who probably serve here too. It's, uh, it's important to never forget what happened here all those years ago. And that we not just look back, but we use our memories of those, that tragic uh, day. But, uh, but we also look forward and look forward in, uh, in ways we've been talking about here to, uh, to today. We, we're uh, fortunate to have um, three of our uh, Homeland Security uh, chairs, past chairs that are here. Uh, and I've had the privilege as a member of this committee to work with all of you. Secretary Cherikov, Napolitano Johnson, my consider friends, and just wonderful public servants in many, many roles. Tom Ridge is not here. You know, college freshman congressman together in 82 elected and served and had a chance to work in this venue as well. Um, we've had uh, uh, also uh, uh, 
uh, Secretary Kelly, John Kelly, we all, all was no John Kelly, retired, four-star um, Marine general who served there briefly, too, too briefly, I think, and succeeded by Kirsten Nielsen, and now with uh, Kevin McAuley. And you're all good people. Well, I think exceptional people. And uh, your leadership has been a blessing for not just the department, but for our, uh, our country. I, I want to ask just a quick question about, uh, about uh, leadership and leadership churn. When uh, Jay Johnson was Secretary of the Department, became Secretary of the Department, Tom Cobra and I met with him and said, we have all these holes. We looked at the leadership structure of the Department of Homeland Security, and uh, from the Deputy Position, Deputy Secretary, the Assistant Secretaries, and on down the line, were enormous holes. It looked a little like, uh, I call it, uh, it's cheese. And uh, we worked hard to do something about that. And I would just ask that Secretary Johnson, would you reflect on that again in context of t what's going on today? within the Department of Homeland Security and the leadership. So that's that's kind of an unpleasant memory. Uh, there were a lot of vacancies when I stepped into the department in December 2013, and you and I and Tom Coburn spent a lot of time talking about that and impressed upon me during my confirmation that uh, we really needed to fill the vacancies. And so that was probably my top priority as soon as I took office. Uh, there were a number of Senate-confirmed vacancies at the time, and I think that we, we benefited from filling those vacancies in rapid fire by, I think, nine months. Just about every job had been filled with a Senate-confirmed person, and there is virtue in having a Senate-confirmed presidential appointee in a lot of these component leadership positions. A, it's, <clears throat> it's more job security, and when you go through that process, you recognize you're accountable to the president, but also to a degree you're accountable to the, to the Congress. And when you're in a Senate-confirmed position, I mean, our actings are all terrific people, as you know, but when you're in a Senate-confirmed position and you've been confirmed by the Senate, you're in a position to provide the president with honest and candid advice sometimes that he doesn't want to hear. And I certainly got the benefit of that from our DHS leaders once they were in the job. And we had some terrific people, as you know. Uh, Craig Fugate is one of the first to come to mind, who, who worked for Janet also. And Craig Fugate needed almost no oversight from me. He was a, a national asset. He was first rate and really did a lot to restore FEMA to um, the position that it, it now holds and occupies. And so um, I believe then that and I believe now that filling the vacancies in this very important agency has got to be the number one priority of the President and the Congress. Thanks so much. If you consider the threats to our, our, uh, our homeland, uh, we talked a little bit about terrorism, huge threat. Uh, we talked about uh, cyber, also a huge threat. We talked about uh, illegal immigration, and I agree with Senate Sec Secretary Napolitano. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the movement of folks coming across our border from Honduras, Guatemala, and Salvador, uh, that's the root cause. And the chairman of the uh, committee talks about it many times. That's the root cause. And we address too often the symptoms of the problems. Uh, we need to re also address root causes. It's causing these folks to, to come here. But, uh, but whether the, the issue, the threat is terrorism, uh, cyber, illegal immigration, uh, or climate change, it's, um, we can't do these by ourselves as a nation. It's, uh, it's, it's got to be a team. And I always like to say there's no I in the, in the word team. And would you just talk about the importance of uh, relationships and cooperation with our friends and allies from around the world, Secretary Chertoff and Janet and, and Jay, please. Well, when I was in office, um, we had uh, great relationships with our um, allies overseas. Even when there was a little bit of political tension, and there sometimes was, for example, around the war of Iraq, in Iraq, um, when I would say the Bush administration was not necessarily popular with the person in the street in Europe, on an operational level, uh, I had very close relations with my counterparts. We worked together. We exchanged information. I mentioned the August 2006 airline plot. <clears throat> Working with my counterpart, John Reed, and, and uh, with a very small number of people in the U.S. read into this, we were able to coordinate and stop what would have been a devastating plot and do it in a way that uh, was minimally disruptive. Um, likewise, even now, I travel around a lot and I meet 
um, senior officials from foreign governments, and they're hungry for American leadership and for American values. And so I think it's very important, uh, particularly that the Congress emphasize our commitment to our allies and friends around the world. Senator Paltrow. Yes, Senator. I think um, uh, the name Homeland Security, in a way, is a misnomer because if you wait till a threat actually reaches our homeland, uh, you may be too late. Uh, and, and it requires the department to have good um, alliances around the world uh, for real-time intelligence uh, and operations, uh, port security, passenger screening, cargo screening, all the like that. That happens abroad. Um, and so uh, uh, the department uh, 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 really needs to be able to look outward as well as inward uh, uh, to improve our overall level of safety and security. Uh, and it would be benefited if uh, the country was uh, seen as actively engaged and welcoming of these alliances as well. Secretary Johnson, just briefly, please. I agree. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, Senator Scott. Chairman Johnson, Senator uh, Peters, thank you and your team for putting this together. Uh, I want to thank Alice and everybody here at the the 9-11 Museum and Memorial for, uh, for hosting us here. Um, I want to thank each of the uh, prior secretaries for being here. Um, this is a solemn time in our nation's history that, that, that day was. Uh, I, was um, I was in the city on September 11th and saw the terror and devastation inflicted on, inflicted on our nation. And unfortunately, it still impacts a lot of people, the survivors, the first responders, and many of the families of the victims. I want to thank um, each of you uh, for your hard work. Uh, you can be continue to be proud of the Department of Homeland Security for everything they do to keep us safe. I was just um, just in the Bahamas with uh, the Coast Guard, and they're right now saving quite a few lives from Hurricane Dorian's devastating af aftermath. And I was just at the border, um, Mexican California border, and you can be very proud of your Border Patrol for what they're doing to, uh, to protect our homeland from drugs, weapons, and terrorism. One question that I have uh, for each of you is, um, if you go back, uh, a lot of discussion after 9-11 was that federal agencies didn't coordinate their information very well. And I just finished eight years as governor, and I watched the same thing continue to happen. We had uh, the Pulse terrorist attack. We had the Parkland shooting. We had five people killed at the airport in Fort Lauderdale, and we had three, I think it was three people killed at a yoga studio right before I finished my time. And in every case, um, the federal government had prior knowledge. They were, they'd gotten tips, and it wasn't followed up with. And to this date, I've never, no one's ever been explained to me why and if anybody's been held account, accountable. And so are we in a better position than we were after 9-11, or do we still have the same issues that federal agencies, specifically in the case, in those cases, uh, the FBI are still not coordinating information with other federal agencies and local government. So if each of you uh, give me your ideas. I'll start. I'll start. Um, from my perspective, uh, it's much better than it used to be. I think that our intelligence community, our law enforcement community, does a much better job of connecting the dots than it used to, though I'm sure that there is more we could do to get better at this. In my experience, I've been impressed with the level of information sharing. I think a lot depends <clears throat> upon the personalities at the top of each agency. If the personalities at the top uh, have a good collegial relationship uh, that trickles down to the people who are sharing the information. Particularly in the intelligence community, I will say that originally I was not a fan of the creation of DNI. I thought it was an extra and unnecessary layer of bureaucracy in our intelligence community. But <clears throat> I saw how Jim Clapper really made it work when I would get an intelligence product every morning. It would come from multiple intelligence agencies. There would be coordinated opinions. There might be dissents. 
And I thought that that process worked well, though there were a lot of different agencies in the alphabet soup that were giving us these products. And I adopted the practice, if there was a dissent in an intelligence report, I would bring the analyst up to see me, the one who wrote it, the one who dissented, and we'd talk it over, and very often you'd realize there wasn't a whole lot of difference. But my overall impression is that, that we're doing a much better job than we certainly did on 9-11, but it depends a lot on the personalities at the top. Uh, uh, I do think intelligence sharing is better. It's always a goal. It's, n it's never perfect. Uh, uh, I agree with Secretary Johnson. It depends in part on leadership from the top. Um, from a homeland security perspective, I, I think that one of the focuses should be effective intelligence sharing into the state and local law enforcement environment. And uh, there, that uh, surely is a work in progress. Um, I, I would agree with that. And I think one of the challenges that we're facing is, as we're dealing with these inspired terrorists who are operating at the local level, it's often going to be the local authorities who get the first word. And just as we have an NCTC that's supposed to coordinate among federal agencies, um, I think the fusion centers um, which DHS has stood up with state and locals ought to perhaps have a broader mission, again, to look at the issue of domestic terrorists and not only the jihadi terrorists. What would each of you like the private sector to do that it's not doing today uh, to deal with Homeland Security? Let me begin. I'd like to see more investment and more coordination on cybersecurity. Most of the assets uh, that can be attacked are in private hands. Uh, some companies have done a very good job of stepping up, but a lot of them just hope someone's going to take care of the problem for you. Thank you. Senator Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Peters for your continued attention to the issue of Homeland Security and terrorism and for convening this hearing today. I'd also like to thank all of today's witnesses for their lifelong dedication and attention to public safety and for your efforts to protect our citizens and keep the United States homeland safe, secure, and free. Those thanks also go to everybody who is here from local and state law enforcement. Homeland security is a team effort and a team mission, and I am very, very grateful for all of your efforts. And a special thank you to the 9-11 National Memorial Museum, uh, Ms. Greenwald, to your staff for hosting us on this hallowed ground. It is such a moving tribute to all of those who perished nearly 18 years ago today. I, like many people on the panel, have a lot of memories about 9-11, but I think the most um, significant one for me was the feeling I had when I picked up my then eight-year-old daughter from school and realizing how much her world had changed. As I sit here, I am once again overwhelmed by our country's profound loss that day and the sacrifices made by first responders, by the military and civilians, and by their loved ones. In some ways, 9-11 changed our country forever, but our response reinforced who we are. We are strong, we are kind, we are resilient, and at times and in places such as this one, we are reverent, and we will fight for and protect our freedom. I wanted to turn uh, to all three of our secretaries, because I've been dealing at home in New Hampshire with members of different houses of worship who are now increasingly concerned for their safety. No one of any faith should have to fear for their life when they visit their house of worship for reflection and prayer. And sadly, as we've talked about over the past few years, Americans have witnessed an increasing number of threats to and violent attacks on houses of worship, both at home and abroad. These threats are not confined to major metropolitan areas. Over the past months, I have visited with members of houses of worship in New Hampshire and heard about the disturbing threats that they and their communities have received. One rabbi noted that they now only open the doors to the temple shortly before services begin 
and locked the doors shortly after the start of services in addition to being concerned about that limitation on the openness that always should mark a house of worship this rabbi says as she leads her congregation during those minutes when the doors are open she wonders is this the night we die a few of these houses of worship received a small amount of funding from the department of homeland security's nonprofit security grant program in order to help secure them against these threats these funds help but not all who applied for the grants were able to get them and there is much more to be done to keep houses of worship in New Hampshire and across the country safe, secure, and free. So Secretary Shortoff, the nonprofit security grant program was created during your time as DHH sec Secretary. Secretaries Napolitano and Johnson, the program continued to expand under your, your watch, but so have the threats. Can each of you share with me your thoughts about how the Congress, the department, and the entire federal government can work to keep soft targets like House of Worship safe from threats. And Secretary Shurtoff, why don't we start with you? <clears throat> well, I mean, this has always been a very challenging issue, and obviously Houses of Worship are very sensitive. We've seen it in schools, and <clears throat> we've seen it in um, commercial establishments. Uh, and it is impossible to lock down everything and have a free society. I do think the grants help, and I do think, frankly, I've observed during certain holidays in various houses of worship, the police sometimes are hired to do some overtime and do some protecting. Some of it is training uh, and advising people about what to do if there's an active shooter, for example. And then the third piece of this has to be, again, better intelligence sharing. But I'd be, I'd be kidding you if I were to say there's an absolute way to stop this. This is a question of risk mitigation. I don't think you can get risk elimination, but we ought to do the best we can. We ought not to let, let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Thank you. Secretary Napolitano. Yeah, I think there's a, a real insight into what uh, Secretary Chernoff said. We can't lock down an open society, uh, but what we can do is, is to help mitigate risk. Uh, the grant program helps. Active shooter training uh, helps additional local law enforcement resources during particular holiday periods uh, may help. Um, it, it really requires uh, using a menu of approaches. There's not, there's not one single approach. Secretary Johnson. So the grants program you mentioned, um, what I was struck by when I would look at the grants every year is the, the program was well known in certain communities but not others. And certain communities had figured out year after year how to apply, how to get the grants, but it, it was not well known enough across the full spectrum of organizations it was intended to help. And so <clears throat> I hope that we have moved in a direction where there's larger awareness over the last couple of years, and that's something I suspect Congress can help with uh, in your respective states and districts. And um, they're all competing, obviously, for the same fixed pot of money. So perhaps Congress should consider raising the level of funding for these types of things, because I agree with your, your assessment of the threat. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch out on is something that others have mentioned, too, on the issue of cyber threats. But I wanted to focus a little bit on what's happening locally. Recent ransomware attacks designed to cripple government operations have targeted nearly every level of government, including a county, Stratford County in New Hampshire, and we've seen attacks on cities across the country. So is there more we can do for the federal government to assist state and local governments with deterring, preventing, and recovering from cyber attacks? Well, let me just begin by saying, um, I, I think um, one thing that could be done would be to help localities do some basic things to secure their infrastructure, including things like, for example, having backups for data. Um, it's not going to eliminate the problem, but it's going to reduce the issue. Yeah. Yeah, helping mitigate the risk is, is uh, important. And um, also, I think uh, uh, we ought to be exploring what the federal government uh, can do and is doing by way of attribution uh, uh, to help find the source of these attacks so that an appropriate response can be constructed. 
I think the single best thing anyone can do in that situation is raise the level of awareness about security among the people that use the system. Um, you'd be surprised the number of people who don't know how to respond to a suspicious email. And a lot of these attacks begin with an act of spear phishing. Somebody opened an email or an attachment they should not have opened. And so simply raising the level of awareness among people we entrust with the system goes a long way. Thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to report that our county officials did recognize a phishing email when they got it, and they had a pen, pen and pencil backup system in place as they shut things down. But it's going to be something we need to continue to focus on. Thank you all again for your service and for your testimony here today. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Johnson, can I just ask you one more time to tell us about your guest, your special guest who's with you? His name is Roger Perino. He's sitting right there. He doesn't like to be the center of attention. Um, he uh, is a Marine, and I met him when we uh, worked drug cases together 30 years ago. And on September 11, 2001, he was a New York City police detective working in Midtown and saw what was happening, uh, ran into harm's way, and uh, frankly was almost one of the people we had a moment of silence for and, and was the recipient of the Medal of Valor from the mayor. Went on at my recommendation to be appointed by Governor Cuomo to be Commissioner of Homeland Security for New York State. Thank you for that. And uh, uh, Detective Commissioner, I, I thought it would be appropriate we might just take a moment to honor you because I notice as I look around here, I see men and women wearing the uniform of the United States. I see some of New York's finest here. Uh, I've got to talk with some of the families of the survivors. This, this building, this place is, is such a monument to the courage of folks like you who put on this uniform and who protect us every day and who run towards danger. And, and here you are a living monument to that. So I, I don't want to miss this opportunity to say thank you for what you did and to give everybody here a chance to say to you and to all of you here in this building who are wearing uniform, who are protecting us, who are serving us, thank you for protecting us. Thank you for representing the best of New York and the best of America. So thank you very much. Thank you. I do want to raise an issue now that, that uh, has not been raised yet, but is extremely important to, I believe, the security of the American homeland and certainly to the security of my state. I represent the state of Missouri. I spent uh, part of my time in August when I was home in Missouri traveling around some of the most economically distressed communities, counties in, in my state, 114 counties in Missouri, and I chose to visit some of those that uh, don't normally get visits from the press and media and so forth, and something that every single person, every single one, in every single community that I visited told me about was the epidemic of drug abuse that is crippling and killing entire communities, literally killing families, schools. It's unbelievable. And in my state, it's, it's overwhelmingly meth. And it is coming, according to uh, the federal government, it is coming overwhelmingly across the southern border. Uh, just according to the 2018 DEA National Drug Threat Assessment Report, most of the meth available in the country, and certainly in the state of Missouri, is produced in Mexico and is smuggled across the southwest border. Missouri has seen a 52% increase in meth addiction treatment admissions in the last seven years, according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Services Administration. It is hard for me to describe to you, unless you were to visit, and to see what this epidemic of drug abuse is doing to the towns and families and schools in my state. What a crisis this is. And so I want to ask about what we can give voice, first of all, to that crisis and ask what it is we can do to address this very real crisis that is being driven by what is going on on the border. And I think, Secretary Napolitano, let me just start with you because I think I must have misunderstood you. I read your testimony. I heard you say in your opening remarks that you did not think that the border represents any threat to the homeland. I must have misunderstood you because surely you couldn't have meant that the people in my state 
who are losing their lives, losing their children, losing their family members, the, the, the law enforcement who are completely overwhelmed by this epidemic that is coming across the border. I mean, surely that constitutes a threat to the security of the people of this country. Don't, I mean, are, are, don't you agree with that? Look, um, I think the border, as I said, is a zone to be managed. Um, it is uh, certainly an area where law enforcement needs to be engaged in terms of drug smuggling and gun smuggling uh, and the like. Um, it requires a whole of government effort. It requires partnership with Mexico in terms of how the ports themselves are managed. And that's where, when smuggling occurs, the bulk of it occurs through the ports of entry. It requires using the best available technology um, for inspection of vehicles uh, and for manifesting of cargo and the like. Um, uh, but uh, uh, what I uh, mean to suggest is that the border itself is not the number one threat to the safety and security of the American people, despite the overwhelming public attention being drawn to the border as the function of DHS. But you think that it is a threat? You said in your testimony, both this morning and in your written testimony, you didn't think it was a threat at all. Not, not the number one threat, but no threat. That it just isn't a threat to the Homeland Security. I can't, I can't understand that. And what concerns me about it is, it seems to be increasingly the position of some members of your party who say it's also not a threat at all. And I just, I don't understand how that can be the case, given the threat that my state and the people in my communities are facing. If, if we don't do something to stem the flow of illegal drugs across that border, I don't know what these folks are going to do. And I, I just don't understand when people say it's just not a threat. I think we need to look for areas of agreement. I think uh, but is we, it a threat? Can, we, we can all can we agree, agree on that. We can all agree that we deserve a safe and secure border, uh, that the border needs to be enforced. Um, and you won't get any uh, question about that from me. Uh, the way I wrote my testimony, however, was to say that the border is a zone. It's a zone to be man a zone to be managed in terms of threat, but it is not the number one threat to the safety and security of the American people. When you talk about drugs. Right? And I understand the opioid epidemic and the meth epidemic. I was a local state prosecutor. I was a federal prosecutor. I understand this phenomenon very well. I reach out and sympathize, empathize with the people of Missouri and other states across this country who have experienced the, the devastation caused by this epidemic. I think what we need to be looking for is uh, how do we um, prevent the importation of drugs? How do we deal with addiction as a disease, as a country? Um, that's really where the threat is, not in terms of overall border management, not in terms of a wall between the United States and Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time's expired. Thanks, Senator Hawley. Uh, we really do not have time for another round of questions, although I think this thing could go on literally for, for hours. But I would like to afford all three of you an opportunity to, you know, if there's something that we didn't discuss, you know, talk about it. And as we discussed last night, and I think it's pretty apparent here today, the fact that you're willing to offer your time, your counsel, uh, your advice, uh, first of all, this committee appreciates it, and we'd appreciate it in the future. I mean, that's, that is a solid offer. I mean, I would love to have you work with us uh, to move this country forward. But uh, why don't we start in reverse order with the uh, Secretary Johnson. If you have a few closing comments, uh, please make some. As a former public servant, uh, I guess I would plead with all of you who are today in the United States Congress in positions of power what I've observed happening over the last couple of years is we don't seem to have, except at levels that the public doesn't appreciate, we don't seem to have enough opportunities to 
reach across the aisle and achieve something that requires political risk and is politically hard. It wasn't that long ago that we came very close to comprehensive immigration reform. The Senate passed it by 68 votes. There was a lot of Democrats and a lot of Republicans. On the recognition that immigration reform included both path to citizenship, DACA, take care of the dreamers, and border security, and smart border security. And people on both sides of the aisle were willing to coalesce around both those principles and a lot in between. What I observe happening now is very few people are willing to do that anymore. And everyone is standing in their, in their corners screaming at each other as the positions on both sides become more and more absurd. To the disservice of the American people you were elected to serve. And that is reflective of a lot of other issues in my judgment. And so my plea as a private citizen is to tone down the rhetoric. I think this committee in particular is an excellent place to do that because I do know that you try to operate in a bipartisan way. Please tone down the rhetoric in Washington to take care of the people's business. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Johnson. Secretary Napolitano. You know, I think the greatest service this committee can give um, is to help provide st a strategic oversight of the entire Homeland Security enterprise. What are the greatest risks facing the country? How are they best mitigated? What resources are necessary to make sure that we are as safe as we can be, albeit, albeit um, uh, we will never be risk-free and we live in an open society? Um, but I think if this committee can occupy that overall kind of board of directors role, it would serve the department well. Secretary Chertoff. <clears throat> well, Mr. Chairman, I'd be delighted to accept your invitation to continue to work with the committee on, on these issues. Um, you know, it, it, it means a lot to have this hearing here because I vividly remember in the days, hours and days and weeks after 9-11 how the country came together and we uh, recognized that this wasn't an attack on people of one party or one religion or one national origin, but on all Americans. And I remember being with Congress a few days afterwards in, a, in the House chamber, both the Senate and the House present, Republicans and Democrats, all unified in terms of their attitude to this. Um, I had one of the privileges I had as secretary was to go to uh, Camp Victory in Iraq and swear in new American citizens wearing the U.S. Army uniform. They came from all over the world, some of them actually from the region, all religions. They were uh, legal, they had green cards, and they qualified for citizenship, and they stood in uniforms, not far from where there was live fire, taking the oath of American citizenship. And to me, that's what America is about. It's what binds us together is not national origin or religion or ethnicity, but belief in a common set of values. And so I think it's important when we think about homeland security to recognize it begins with unity of effort, not just within the department, but within the country. And that ought to be a requirement number one for everybody to reemphasize and to underscore that we are a nation bound by common values and a common constitution. That is what makes us great. That is what motivated the people we have celebrated in this hall. And that is something we can need to continue to cherish and uphold. Thank you. Senator Peters, do you have a few closing remarks? Well, again, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, holding this hearing and your staff, who has uh, done an outstanding job putting this uh, all together. I also want to uh, thank Alice Greenwald again, uh, as well as your tremendous uh, staff, as well as volunteers for this, uh, this amazing place that allows us to uh, pay uh, honor to those who, who lost uh, their lives here, uh, and also to continue to educate us as to what happened here and why we must never forget and, and make sure that this never happens again. And I understand your job is gonna become more difficult as, as uh, the next generation comes along who looks at this as history, not something as vivid as uh, in the minds of, as it is with all of us uh, here today. 
But if we don't uh, educate the next generation, uh, that then leads to the potential of it happening again, and it must never happen again. So you are involved in a very important mission with you and your staff, so thank you, and thank you for having us here. And to the, the uh, secretaries for your testimony today, uh, and I think all three of you in your wrap-up uh, said it uh, extremely well, and something that uh, I take to heart as I work on this committee is to understand that the Department of Homeland Security has one of the toughest jobs you can possibly have uh, in the federal government, because you have to do, you have to do two things. First off, you have to keep us all safe. And to me, that's the number one job of the federal government is to keep Americans safe from harm. And that's gotta be first and foremost on the mission. But you also have to balance it with the things that all three of you mentioned, uh, the values that have built this country, that we are a free society. What makes the United States so special is that we are an open and free society. And we have to endeavor to keep Americans safe while also protecting constitutional rights to protect civil rights. That's a balancing job that is incredibly difficult to accomplish and one that we're going to have to constantly work at to make sure that we can achieve that uh, right balance. The other, the other thing we must do uh, for the Department of Homeland Security while you're keeping us safe, you also have to make sure the economy is robust and, and moving forward. So I know the borders uh, in Michigan, some of the busiest borders in North America, we, the, the folks there have to keep us safe while making sure that uh, commerce is getting there on time and our just-in-time deliveries for the auto companies are there right when they go on the assembly line. Any kind of delay ripples throughout the whole supply chain, so they are watching that very closely. But at the same time, you've got to keep us safe. So this is a very, very tough job. And I, I thank you uh, for your service to the country. I thank you for your willingness to continue to work with us. Because as we deal with a, a rapidly changing world and rapidly changing threats, uh, uh, it's always important to step back and remember where we came from, understand the lessons that we learned in the past so that we can apply those lessons uh, to the future. So thank you for your service. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator Peters. Uh, again, I'd like to start by again thanking the secretaries. It's, it's an overwhelming job. It's, it's a responsibility each one of you assumed and every secretary assumes that's hard to contemplate. Uh, you'll just get blamed for failures. You don't get a whole lot of credit for success. So I, I truly appreciate your past service and, again, your willingness to consult this committee in the future. Uh, again, I want to thank Alice Greenwald and, and everybody who's worked on this amazing and remarkable place. Um, if you're an American watching this hearing, uh, come here. You need to be reminded. It's true, we, we can never forget. And the thought that went into this place as, as we walked down into this chamber, the way those first responders did, um, what really struck me were those pictures of the people that day in New York all fixated on the exact same thing as we were told two billion other people around the world watched in real time the tragedy of that day. But as others have, have remarked, we have the first responders, we have members of the military. To me, we, ha we had a great dinner last night. We all went around the table. I think it was Senator Peters and Senator Romney's idea. Let's just all go and describe what you were doing 9-11. Those of us who are alive, we all remember it. And for my part, I was just in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, in our office, looking at the TV and making probably the exact same comment that probably two billion people made or thought, this changes everything. But then in the days that followed that, the pictures that emerged of the firefighters, the, the Port Authority, the, the, the cops in New York City, the responders, walking up the steps rushing into danger to save their fellow Americans. As we watch the finest among us, the men and women in the military also respond and volunteer and go halfway around the world to not only defend our freedom, but literally try and develop freedom and liberty and democracies for people they have no idea who they were. That is something pretty unique about America. We're not perfect, 
but I happen to think we are a phenomenal force for good in the world. And in the midst of tragedy, and not just 9-11, every mass shooting, every hurricane, every natural disaster seems to always bring out the examples of the goodness of the American people. To me, that's what this hearing is about. This is what our responsibility is to not only preserve this good nation for future generations, to make sure it thrives. That's our responsibility. That's what we dedicate this committee, committee to do. So again, I just want to thank everybody for attending. I want to, attending. I want to thank everybody for their service and really just conclude by saying, God bless America. Now I have to read the magic words. The hearing record will remain open for 15 days until September 24th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned.